So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter number 10. Have you ever been at work and then looked at the clock to note that it was, let's say, 9 o'clock? And things are going slow. You may not have much to do, or maybe it's just one of those slow times on the job. You glance at the clock, and at what seems like three hours has passed, it's just five minutes, and it's 9.05. Time is just creeping along. But then there are other times on the job, whenever you start at 9 a.m. and work for five minutes, look up at the clock, and you work through lunch, and it's 3 p.m. Well, I don't care what time it is, I ain't going to miss lunch for nothing. (laughs) But some do, and, you know, that's understandable. But anyways, for those fast times on the job, we like to say time is flying. However, the speed of time hasn't changed. Whether you had a lot to do or a little to do, the clock was moving at the same speed. But when I think about time, I think about how time is running out. Read with me in Hosea 10, uh, verse 12 and 13. It says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thine own way, in the multitude of your mighty men. When I said time was running out, I meant that time was running out to seek the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for uh, this body of believers, the church, Lord, and we pray tonight that you will be with us and that everyone will be safe and that in everything that we do, that we will seek you and we will honor you and glorify you through whatever we do in our lives, Lord. Thank you uh, for Michaela and Rihanna and the things that they are doing for you this summer, God. Be with the Rhode Island Mission Trip as well and all the many activities that we have going on at church. I pray that you'd be with them. Uh, But ultimately, Lord, I pray that you would be um, with your word tonight and that you would use it and that you would speak to certain hearts through it, Lord, and that you would uh, just guide me as I speak tonight. Thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, and it's your name we pray. Amen. Now, this passage is specifically addressed to Israel. So Israel needed to seek the Lord. They had plowed wickedness and reaped iniquity, is what our passage said. Israel would turn from God, and then they would grow wicked, and God would bring judgment. We see this uh, back in the time of Moses, when Moses led them out of Egyptian slavery. They were in Egyptian slavery, and years after that, they ended up in Assyrian uh, captivity, and from there, Babylonian, on to Persian, and then ultimately, Uh, in Roman captivity when we enter the New Testament. All of these things were as a result of their sin and how they grew away from the Lord. All of these different times Israel was in captivity and slavery was as a result of sin. That is why there were prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They were all warning of God's coming judgment. Israel even now today has turned from the Lord and what has come to be known as the tribulation period will serve as a final rebuke of Israel in the last days to bring them back to him. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble in scripture, and it's prophesied much uh, throughout the Bible, but that is going to come during the end times. Anyhow, Israel constantly gets caught up in wickedness, uh, such as idolatry, and they commit adultery against God. Our passage said that they had eaten the fruit of lies. They had believed their pagan idolatry instead of what God has given them. They were, as Romans 1 says, they turned the truth of God into a lie, and they served the creature more than the creator. Men who were coming uh, to be, and they were claiming to be a prophet of God, and they were promising prosperity and no judgment, they were listening to them and they were obeying what they had to say rather than the prophets of God that I mentioned earlier. They had drifted away from God, and Israel had ultimately walked away from the Lord as many have today. But it was time for Israel to seek the Lord, and many in the church pews today have walked away from the Lord if they were ever walking with him in the first place. But it is time to seek the Lord. So Israel needed to seek the Lord, but I think also the church needs to seek the Lord. The church of today, I believe, needs to seek the Lord. Perhaps if this passage in Hosea was written to the church today, it would say something about the laziness of the church. Now, I love the church, but the church, and not necessarily specifically New Hope, but the global church, including New Hope, has become lazy. It is time for the church to seek the Lord. Jesus gave one final commandment before he ascended, and that was to tell others, to make disciples. But the church of today is not hot and it's not cold. It has grown lukewarm. 
We are living in what the book of Revelation calls the Laodicean church age. It says in Revelation 3, 14 and 16, unto the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that you are neither hot or cold. I would rather you be hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm, not hot or cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. And that's what the church is today. We are lukewarm and self-serving. We don't carry out the, the one command that Jesus gave before he ascended into heaven. The reason we aren't automatically caught up to heaven after we are saved is because we have a mission to do here on earth. Our mission is to spread the gospel and to tell others about what the Lord has done for us in our lives. There are so many who claim Christ when they don't carry out the mission of Christ. If you worked for Wendy's, for instance, but did nothing while there, you didn't make any food, you didn't clean anything or contribute in any way, you don't work for Wendy's. You claim the name of a Wendy's employee, but did no work while there, and then you'd be fired. Why don't we treat Christianity the same way? If we don't do the work set before us by God himself, then why do we claim the name of Christian? If we're not going to evangelize, why do we claim that name? Because that's the mission that Christ gave to us, was to evangelize. The mission of every believer is evangelism, and if you aren't up for it, then why claim Christ? That is what the church is all about. Church has been turned into a place for believers to be pampered, not a place for the lost to find Christ. There is no purpose in the church if we do nothing outside of these four walls. Why talk about the Bible if we're the only ones hearing about it? Why not go and just shut up the church and just let the believers in and keep the lost out if we're the only ones who are going to hear about it? There would be no reason if it wasn't for evangelism to not do those things. The church is not making disciples. Jesus' biggest command to us has turned into our biggest failure. So it's time for, me, for us the, as the church to repent for the laziness that we've expressed. Every believer should be as Jeremiah, who had the word of God in his heart as a burning fire, shut up in his bones, and he couldn't shut up about the message that God has given to him. That's what every believer should be like. We should have the word of God. We should hide it in our heart. Whenever we hear it, we shouldn't be able to shut up about what God has told us. We shouldn't be able to shut up about the gospel. But we should be telling everybody, any believer we come into contact to, we should be telling them about the message that God has given to us, proclaiming the gospel. We should go out and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, says Jesus. He's always going to be with us. If we go and evangelize every time we should have the word of God in us shut up in our bones as a fire. Jeremiah was on fire for the Lord. Many Christians today are not. So I tell you, it's time for the church of God to get their nose out of the newspaper and into the Bible, because if we do that, we wouldn't be able to shut up about the gospel. We have to go to the law, so they're not going to come to us. Every believer should also be as Paul who said, necessity is laid on me to preach the gospel. Woe to me if I preach not the gospel. We should feel that feeling that Paul had, that every believer, I mean, every non-believer that we talk to, we should feel the necessity to tell them about Christ. We should feel that necessity because it is a necessity. It's, it's something that the Lord has commanded us to do. We can't just not listen to it. Instead, believers today are like the Gadarians that Brother Corey spoke of this morning. The Gadarians wanted all the good things of Jesus, but when they got uncomfortable, they didn't want him any longer. They didn't want Jesus. They just escorted him out of their town. The church has grown to be like that. We want the good things of Jesus, but whenever we hear the mission of Jesus, we don't want any part of him. We're like, okay, Jesus, thank you for the good things, but I, I, I feel uncomfortable telling other people about the Lord. But the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's not what the church is doing today. Are we seeking the lost out to tell them of a savior? Are we presenting the living water, the bread of life? Because there's a dying world out there. They're dying of hunger and of thirst, and we're not bringing them the bread of life, the living water. We're not proclaiming the gospel to every creature, as Mark 16, 15 says. Jesus is longing for relationships with people that are outside of these four walls. We're not the only ones he's concerned about. Jesus loves everyone, and he wants to have a relationship with everyone, and we are his ambassadors it is time to get back on track of the mission that God has given to us.
However, I don't think that the Lord is just concerned with the church seeking him. I think he's concerned with individuals seeking him as well. I think the reason he's concerned with certain individuals, and I think everybody as an individual, uh, but we have sinned against the holy God. We have sinned against the holy God. 1 Timothy 1.9 says that the law was not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers. Well, you say, Jackson, I hadn't murdered my father and mother. I ain't a manslayer. But we've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. There is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. We've all messed up. We're all ungodly sinners. We're all in need of a Savior. We have sinned against the holy God. It wasn't made for a righteous man because there is not, there's not a righteous man besides Jesus Christ. We have sinned against the holy God who sent his own dear son to shed his blood for those unholy and profane acts we've committed. And he, he did all of it so that we could get a relationship with him. When he has done no wrong, we sin against him. When he shows his love and compassion to us, we sin against him and show him our selfishness. Friend, you have sinned against a holy God. And Romans 6.23 tells us the cost of that sin. It says, for the wages of sin is death. We all deserve death. It's something that all humans deserve because we've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the last part of the verse is what I like the most. The eternal, but eternal life is the gift of God. So my question is, will you seek the Lord today? Will you turn from your sin? Because Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Christ is returning soon. No man knows the day of the hour. But when the Lord returns, what do you want to hear? It's going to be one or two things. It's going to be either, depart from me, ye who work iniquity, I never knew you. Or it's going to be, well done, good and faithful servant. I'd rather hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 7 is clear. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And the scripture is clear. The will of the Father is that all might come to repentance. I don't know about the rest of you, but when I stand before my Savior's face, I don't want to stand there ashamed and embarrassed because I didn't seek him here on earth. Because I did nothing for him while I was here. I didn't witness to the lost and make his name famous. I didn't do the one job he gave us to do. Instead, I did what I wanted to do. But I want to stand there before my Savior who Revelation says has the voice as of the sound of many waters, whose eyes are as a flame of fire and his head and hair as white as wool. I want to stand before that Savior and say, Lord, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God by salvation to all who believe. That's what I want to say before my Savior and say. I want to say, Lord, I wasn't ashamed of you while I was here on earth. I told and I made your name famous. I did the will of the Father in heaven which is witness to the lost. I fulfilled the great commission of making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I taught them to observe the things that you have commanded, Lord. And then you know what I want to hear him say? I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. For some of you, that might not get you excited like it does me. I get really excited whenever I think about the Lord, you know. Um, but if that doesn't excite you, that's probably because you're not seeking the Lord in the first place. It's probably because you have sin in your life and you hadn't repented of it. But now is the time for repentance. It is time to seek the Lord. He's as the father of the prodigal son. He will run and he will embrace you with open arms, but it starts with repentance. If the son would have never came back to the father, he couldn't have embraced him. If we come back to the Lord, he will embrace us with open arms, but it starts with coming back. Will you seek him today, friend? Scripture says we can come boldly to the throne, to the throne of grace. Boldly to the throne of grace. If we want to talk to the father, we can talk to him. He'll listen. We can go boldly to the throne of grace. Now, when it end. Uh, by reading 2 Corinthians, uh, it's a passage that I love, and it says, We, as workers together with him, 
beg you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Well, how do you receive the grace of God in vain? Not telling others, not witnessing, not telling the lost about who the Lord is. That's how you could receive the grace of God in vain. He says, for he saith, I have heard you in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I aided you. Behold, now is the time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're living in sin, if you've walked away from the Lord, if you're in need of repentance, now is the day. Now is the time of salvation. Come back to the Lord today, and he'll embrace you with loving, open arms. Let's pray.